inspiration in the kitchen can come from a lot of places. Cookbooks, cravings, special requests. But sometimes, necessity is the mother of invention. Let me share a secret recipe. Discover an ingredient that fires your imagination. Choose other flavors to match. Find the best way to cook them. My secret recipe? Cooking without a recipe. My garden is overflowing with dill these days and I hate to see any of it go to waste. So I think we're looking at an all dill menu for the next little while. Fortunately, it's an easy herb to get along with. There's no shortage of ways to use dill. Dill is one of those herbs that you can use with wild abandon. It's not as strongly flavored as rosemary or sage or cilantro. It's kind of like parsley with a little something extra added. It's delicate, so it's usually best to add it last because it can handle prolonged heating. So when I make seafood chowder, that's when it goes in last and bacon goes in first. You can make a quick and easy seafood chowder with a bunch of basic ingredients and it's a great way to use up any fish or seafood or dill for that matter. I love how simple chowders are. I love how traditional they are. As a cook they connect you with generations of other cooks all of whom prize simplicity and that's really what a chowder is. It's just a simple soup using whatever you happen to have on hand. Chowders originated in fishing villages and traditionally always included some kind of cured pork product. The sort of pork that could handle months and months on a shelf. Salt pork, fat back, or today's bacon, which always tastes better crisp. And it's usually a good idea to get rid of most of the fat that comes off when you crisp it. Most, but not all. You want to leave a little bit of fat behind to saute off the onions and celery. When I think of all the times I've browned bacon and onions in this pot, it's amazing how many different dishes begin exactly this way. Browning the onions is a great idea. It adds a lot of flavor to them, but you don't really need to brown the celery. It just needs to be heated through for a moment. It's time to add the liquids. I tend to use roughly equal parts milk and cream. Cream adds lots of body, but let's just say it's a bit richer than milk. Now, I don't know about your fishing village, but in my fishing village, they don't grow grapes, but that doesn't mean you can't Add a splash of white wine, if you like, to your seafood chowder. The best chowders are not thickened with flour or cornstarch. They're thickened with potato starch. You can speed the process up by simply grating the potato straight into the chowder. There's only one kind of fish that works in chowder the kind that swims in water. In other words, you can use any fish at all to make great chowder, and the fresher the better. Your supermarket may even do some of the work for you and chop up a chowder mix. And shrimp, shrimp is always a great choice. A good seafood chowder should look like a seafood stew. Now for some seasoning. The only thing better than a seafood chowder like this is a seafood chowder like that with some fresh dill in it. Chowder really is just an exercise in creative simplicity. Every ingredient in here adds something to the whole. So that means that if you change just one ingredient or add a new ingredient, you change the whole thing. Dill seafood chowder.
I'm constantly looking for inspiration when I cook, but sometimes it finds me. There's a lot of dill in the garden right now, so I'm stirring it into everything. Let's just say we're going to have a delicious dinner, starting with our favorite seafood chowder. A pot full of traditional bacon, onion, celery, a splash of wine, milk, rich cream, grated potato for a thickener, and fish, shrimp, whitefish, salmon, any fish, whatever you have. And dill. The delicate flavor of dill always goes well with seafood, but it also tastes great in a freshly baked loaf of bread. Some may call this sacrilege, but hey, anything that helps you get a true loaf of bread on the table full of grains and goodness is just fine. And besides, this is scientifically designed to contain the mess no matter what you put in it. Cooking is an art, and baking is a science, but you don't need to be Einstein to bake a perfect loaf of bread. All you need are two things, great ingredients, and accurate measures. In a sense, you're following a formula, so the best way to ensure success is to be accurate, but that doesn't mean you can't play a bit. In fact, my gold standard bread machine recipe includes lots of room for improv, but first the basics. Warm water. Room temperature, body temperature. It warms the dough for the yeast. A cup and a half. Exactly a cup and a half. When you buy it, yeast is actually alive. It's just sleeping. But once it gets a good drink of water, it wakes right up and magically, the loaf of bread rises. All because yeast is alive. Everywhere you look, there's yeast. You might not be able to see it, but it's everywhere. We're surrounded by this stuff. And long ago, cooks figured out how to harness its hidden potential. Basically, like anything else that's alive, yeast likes to eat. Fair enough. But it's what happens when it's done eating that makes it a cook's best friend. Yeast eats carbohydrates and turns them into CO2 and alcohol. CO2 is the gas that makes bread rise. It's also what makes beer and wine bubble. But beyond the gas, it's that alcohol that makes them, shall we say, memorable. Actually, by the time we get around to eating most yeast, it's already dead. But there is one other supermarket staple that's very much alive and very good for you. How about a big helping of Acidophilus, Thermophilus, and Lactobacillus bulgaricus, otherwise known as yogurt? As soon as yeast wakes up, it starts looking for a meal, and its favorite thing to eat is sugar. Any sugar. White, brown, honey, maple, molasses. This is where you get to play a bit because each one of these will add distinctive flavor to your bread. Molasses rye, honey wheat, or plain white sugar with dill. Since I want the dill flavor in the dough to stand out, I don't want the heavier flavors of honey, molasses, or maple to get in the way. Four tablespoons. Yeast plus water plus sugar equals feeding frenzy. Next up, the flour, but not just any flour, bread flour. Because when flour and water are kneaded together, they produce gluten. And gluten is the highly elastic protein structure that captures the gas given off by the yeast as it dines. That gluten allows the bread to expand, to rise, 
and the stronger the flour is, the better the bread is. Three cups of bread flour. There's also room in here for one more cup of grain. I think it's time for the sweet flavor of cornmeal. One cup. I love the texture that cornmeal gives bread. It's got this neat little crunch to it. It adds a little bit of color too, and a lot of flavor. Now here's an old baker's secret. Dry milk powder. This is what gives store-bought white bread its characteristic flavor. It adds quite a bit of sweetness too, and it improves the color of the bread, and you only need two tablespoons. A bit of oil improves the texture of the bread too. And don't forget the salt. Two teaspoons. And last but not least, as much fresh dill as you care to add. Now here's why I like bread machines so much. They're way more patient than I am. They're programmed to take their time, and when you're baking bread, you can taste time and dip. I love following the seasons, and when one of my favorite ingredients is at its peak, I can't resist experimenting and throwing it into everything I cook. Like garden fresh dill in a simple seafood chowder. I've also kneaded some dill into a loaf of freshly baked bread from my bread machine. But why stop there? If you have a lot of something, or if you just like the way it tastes, Feel free to go for it. Dill tastes great in salad, too. And try not to take your greens for granted, because cool, crisp greens can elevate an afterthought to the star of the show. You can store them in the coldest part of your refrigerator in a tightly sealed bag, but if they do wilt a little bit, no problem, because you can always revive them. Here's the secret. Inside these leaves is a network of cells bursting with moisture, but since leaves are mostly surface area, it's very easy for that moisture to flow in and out of the leaves. When it's in, they're crisp, but when it's out, they're limp. So if your greens are a little bit wilted, just soak them in cold water for a few minutes. Moisture will rush right back into the cells and they'll crisp right back up. Of course, a wet leaf is kind of like a Porsche in the garage. It's not living up to its potential, because no matter how crisp these are, no matter what kind of dressing you make, it won't stick to wet salad greens. So, after the car wash, take a moment and dry these off. Take them for a spin. That's crisp. As crisp as the day they were picked. Now there's two ways you can toss dill into a salad. You can toss it into the dressing, then toss the dill dressing into the salad, or you can toss the dill straight into the salad. And why not? Its delicate flavor is perfect with this kind of mixture. You can also toss it into the salad and into the dressing, especially if it's a yogurt dressing. Yogurt is perfect for making salad dressings. It's tangy, like any good dressing, and it's neutral, and that neutrality allows it to carry any other flavor, like dill.
This is a great all-purpose dressing that we enjoy all the time. But what if you don't have a fridge or a garden full of fresh dill? How do you substitute dried herbs for fresh herbs and vice versa? Herbs have the magical ability to add personality to an otherwise boring recipe. To brighten up dull dishes and inspire the licking of plates clean. Because an herb's flavor comes from its essential aromatic oils, herbs are at their best when they're fresh. Drying does preserve them, but tender herbs such as basil, cilantro, and parsley lose so much vitality to the process that they really should only be used fresh. Hardier herbs such as mint, oregano, rosemary, thyme, sage, and even dill often fare rather well during drying, but the process concentrates their flavors quite a bit. So the general rule of thumb is to use about half as much dried as you would fresh. But whether you choose fresh or dry, choose herbs because they add unforgettable flavor and aroma. Flavor is all about balance, so the best dressings are balanced dressings, and because yogurt is so rich and it's so thick, a bright lemon can really bring it alive. Lemon and yogurt and dill is actually very common in Greek cooking, and it's particularly good when you sweeten it up a bit. Honey is packed full of aromatic floral flavor, which makes sense because bees make honey from flowers. Honey's pretty strong too, a little bit goes a long way. Lemon honey yogurt dill dressing, sounds awesome. Lemon first, there's the yogurt, there's the honey, I taste the dill, now that's balanced. Now what am I gonna do with the rest of this dill? Smells like dill. It's a good thing dill tastes so good. It ended up in everything I made today, probably because it tastes so good. It's in the yogurt dressing balanced with sweet honey and sour lemon. They don't call me Edward Salad Hands for nothing. definitely going to want some pepper in this salad too. This is another great way to show off dill and to quickly toss a salad together. Slice cucumber, chop dill, and sweet and sour. A splash of honey, a splash of vinegar. Any vinegar works. I'm using cider vinegar. Touch of salt and as much pepper as you care to add. This is the sort of salad that tastes so good that everybody thinks you slaved over it for hours and hours. You don't necessarily have to tell them that it only took about 10 seconds. It's kind of like a bowl full of speedy pickles. Here's another dish that looks like it took hours to make, but didn't. A simple pot full of traditional seafood chowder. I like to start by browning bacon and onions, then adding celery, a splash of wine, milk, and cream. And to thicken this up, I grated potatoes in. There's also shrimp and white fish and salmon in here too. Topped off with dill in the pot and in the bowl.
Now, have you ever sliced a loaf of bread and by the time you get down to the end of it, the loaf is all sort of twisted and on an angle? Here's how to make sure that doesn't happen. Stand right behind the loaf of bread. I mean, where else would you stand? But look at the top of your blade. Look at the top of it, because if you can see the edge of the blade, the bottom of the blade, that means the blade's turning. If you can only see the top of the blade, you're on the right track. Cornmeal dill bread, what a great flavor combination. You can let a favorite ingredient show you the way too, because when you do, the results are guaranteed to taste good. Although you might just get your fill of dill until next year's harvest. What's that in your bowl? Chowder. Yum. That's good, isn't it? Mmm. Yeah. It looks like a dill celebration here. Mm -hmm. Did you say delicious? Delicious. <laughs> Let's do a shrimp cheers. Ready? Cheers! Cheers! Mmm. Boy, is that ever good, eh? Mmm. Knock, knock. Who's there? Dill. Dill who? Delicious! <laughs> <laughs>